to you by Chemistry. Hello listeners and welcome back to Brought to You by Chemistry. Now this is our final episode on antimicrobial resistance and honestly, we've spoken to some amazing experts in this series, right? I, I for one, I've, I've been thrilled to be able to chat to these people, these titans of knowledge. I'm not going to say who the best expert has been, it was the vet. But look, we've all been on this journey right now. We're basically all have PhDs in antimicrobial resistance because that's how life works, right? Yeah, we just listen to things and then you're an expert. Anyway, right now we've got a pretty exciting episode lined up because we're going to be hearing about antimicrobial resistance from around the world, learning about the challenges that different countries and continents face. First, we're starting with a chat that I've had with former Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Sally Davies. Joining me today is Professor Dame Sally Davies, all right? She's the <laughs> UK Special Envoy on Antimicrobial Resistance and Master of Trinity College, Cambridge. She's a globally recognized voice in advocating on AMR from her work while she was Chief Medical Officer of England from 2010 to 2019, that's almost a decade, to working as a co convener of the UN Interagency Coordination Group, which reported to the UN in 2019, and as a member of the UN Global Leaders Group on AMR. Try saying that all 10 times twice. Originally trained as a doctor, Dame Sally worked as a consultant hematologist before joining the civil service in 2004. She's held positions as chief scientific advisor to the Department of Health, where she established and was the inaugural director for the National Institute for Health Research. That's a lot of things. Um, so person that I have just given you know, a very, very small, very brief introduction to, you know, the highlights. Could you please introduce yourself? So I suppose you'd say... I'm a doctor, I was chief medical officer, so I went from looking after individual patients, specializing actually in sickle cell disease, to thinking about the health of our whole population. In that uh, role, I became interested in antimicrobial resistance, superbugs, and when I moved to Trinity College on retirement as chief medical officer, the government asked me to continue my work in AMR as their special envoy on AMR globally. Wow. So have you ever thought that perhaps you're doing too much? I think my husband might say I'm doing too much. But the problem, as you will know, Alex, if you care about something, look at people who care about climate change. It can almost take over your, your life. So um, I care about this. We haven't got the politicians interested in the way they need to be. So no. I need to do more. Okay, so for you, what do you think more is? I mean, that sounds actually quite Paxman there. What can you do more? Tell me right now. But for you, what do you think more is? Like, where does Dame, uh, Professor Dame Sally Davies stop? Well, we really do have to raise awareness across the globe about the growing problem of antimicrobial resistance and what we need to do and then get action about 1.3 million people die every year of superbugs. And if you look at the distribution, it's much worse in low and middle income countries in the developing world than it is in the global north. Why is that? Well, of course, we have much better infection prevention and control. We have much better sanitation. And we look after the antibiotics we use much more carefully because we have the health systems, whereas if you go to many sub-Saharan countries where AMR is very bad and the death rate, one in five of the people who die are aged under five is high. Well, many of them have to buy antibiotics over the counter without a prescription, without being checked. Do they really need them? And they may not be able to afford a full course. So it's no surprise it's worse there. We need to get everyone aware, then we have to move forward on it. And there are many areas to do with health security, food security, and environmental security, all of which take commitment. And there's a big intergenerational issue here. Just as we have used fossil fuels, just as in this country we've had my generation, free education, and uh, cheap mortgages, 
we've used the antibiotics. We owe it to the next generations to sort this out, or the death rate will be really high. I mean, I, I feel both optimistic and slightly sad hearing that. You know, that strange balance of like, yes, things are going to get better. Oh, no, things are currently scary. Well, they get better, aren't they? But we've got to make sure that they do eventually get better. Um, and that's why uh, I do a lot of work with the, the public, but even with our students. So our Trinity students have set up an AMR club, and they're doing with our endowment activist investing. They asked at Yum's annual general meeting for a report on how antibiotics are used. Over 80% of antibiotics are used in the food chain. First time they asked, nothing happened. The second time, other shareholders said, yeah, that's a good idea. We want to report. So you can use investing. We, uh, you can use consumers and consumer power and the consumer index in the states has absolutely changed um, eating in fast food restaurants. So I can recommend Chipotle. They don't use antibiotics for growth promotion or inappropriately. Okay, I'm just going to say I absolutely love Chipotle. So I'm glad that uh, I, I now have perhaps a scientific reasoning. And so that is the right now. But can you tell us about Professor Dame Sally Davies in the past? All right. How did you first become interested in AMR? So when I became chief medical officer, I found that one of the actually fun roles is to write an independent annual report. And I thought my first could be about infection because I thought that would be uncontroversial. I asked experts to write the chapters because my job was to choose the subject, to frame it, and then to say what uh, the experts have shown what that means for policy. When they came back with their chapters and we looked at it, I said to them, so AMR's getting worse since this was 2013, since I stopped seeing patients in 2006. And they said, yes, it is. So I said, well, then together, we have to give this voice and make sure we get some action. Over 80% of antibiotics um, given in the food chain, of which much is because it's much cheaper than keeping intensive farming clean or um, because they want growth promotion. That's disgusting, as well as giving rise to antimicrobial resistance that can transmit to humans, but also puts the food chain at risk. Did you know that animals, and I count us as animals, pee or poo out over 90% of antibiotics that then go into the um, into the water system. So, for instance, the Ganges at uh, uh, the time uh, when people are there has ciprofloxacin levels, that's a strong antibiotic, higher than we try and get in people's plasma to treat them. That's ridiculous. I don't mean in terms of the fact. Obviously, the fact is is you know, correct, but. I would never think about it in in that way on that scale. Like I know that I've sort of I've heard that we do, you know, we release quite a lot of the antibiotics that are in our system. But I didn't realize it was that high. I didn't realize it pulled in places like the Ganges in such high quantities. I mean, is this a relatively new thing or have people known about it for a while and just sort of I think a lot of people have ignored it and of course the other big contributor is um, from manufacturing. If, if uh, the environmental standards are not strict, put in place and, and generally regulated. But there's no doubt that we get more and more information as we raise awareness, people fund research and surveillance and we learn more. And each time it's pretty shocking and makes me realize we must redouble our efforts or um, we won't have a happy planet. I was going to say, I think we all want a happy planet. So, I mean, hearing about this from your perspective is, is something very new. Like I, I've known about sort of these topics from a scientific perspective, you know, and doing this series and learning more and more about this. But from a sort of a political perspective, I mean, what has it been like um, in applying sort of science, understanding sort of policy, in something as important as this, you know, in, in, in terms of health. I mean, 
Have there been any, I mean, first off, can you tell us about your time in government as chief medical officer? And also, like, have there been major political obstacles in the way of tackling antimicrobial resistance? So that's a big two-parter. So in our government, I've been lucky that uh, ministers have listened to me even after I admitted Rishi Sunak, when Chancellor of the Exchequer, made sure that the market failure at aspects of this were on the G7 finance minister's discussion table, including our own um, way pilot uh, of looking at a market incentive that also the Americans are looking at. So I've been lucky to persuade our ministers. It started with Prime Minister Cameron, who funded Jim O'Neill, who's a well-known economist, to look at the economic impact. I'd looked at how climate change came to people's attention, and I realized that Nick Stern looked at the economic impact, and that made a big, brought in the politicians. So uh, David Cameron commissioned um, Jim O'Neill and his work showing the big cost, which was then supported by further work by the World Bank and increasing studies like out of Canada, means that we have had some focus on it. Globally, it's very difficult. It's difficult for people to get their heads around the complexity of climate change. And then you add this to it. And of course, they each make the other worse, um, or at least climate change makes um, AMR worse because it, it changes infectious uh, profiles in countries and brings uh, infections to the colder areas. But, you know, we do have to engage them. The um, UN Secretary General understands that this is a big issue and has talked about it. And that's why the UN has set up the Global Leaders Group that I'm lucky to be on. I guess you sort of mentioned it a little bit briefly there, talking about it in, in a global sense. But do you think that there's a responsibility that the UK has in particular, but I sort of think of the global north, um, to help the, the rest of the world, you know, especially the global south? Those are very interesting terms to use, but sort of on an international basis, what responsibility do you think that we have? Well, it's, uh, I think COVID has been really a big lesson. It shows that no one's safe until everyone's safe. And so this is about infectious organisms impacting our food chain and food security, our environmental security, let alone human beings and our health security. So of course, we all have to work together and have some solidarity. I think um, our Fleming Fund is particularly important because it's very difficult to take action if you don't have data. So what we're doing is helping countries develop their data but, and there's a lot more work to be done on that. But if you don't have data, difficult to make a policy, difficult to make a, a policy decision that will need financing. But we will need, if we can unblock the market failure, then the rich countries need to pay for that. But then we'll have to look at tiered pricing so that poor people in poor countries with proper stewardship of those drugs, so they're not indiscriminately used, but can have access for when they need it. See, now this sounds, it's positive, but at sort of this point, it's its not hypothetical, but whatever the thing between is happening right now and hypothetical is, um, it's there. It sort of seems like a very, very good plan and something that I guess you'd like to see happen, we'd all like to see happen. Um, but as it's not quite there yet, like what initiatives or changes have you seen or been a part of that you think, oh, you know what, that's gone really well. Let's keep doing that. You know, what, what can we build on that we've done already? Well, actually, in Britain, we've done lots. So we started with looking at the levels in our NHS, and those have generally come down, of AMR-resistant uh, bugs. We looked at the use of antibiotics, and we've managed to reduce use, which shows we're getting <laughs> closer to good use, so we've got further to go. So that's in the human sector. In the animal sector, over the last five, six years, voluntarily, our uh, producers, our farmers have, I never thought I'd be singing the praises of, of farmers, but anyway, they have reduced use voluntarily by more than 50%, and they're still working at it to keep going. So that's very good. And we're starting to look at 
um, much more monitoring of sewage and things like that. So I'm proud of what we've done internally. Uh, globally, our Fleming Fund lead, well, it's the only major program of helping people develop their data and think about stewardship. One beautiful program runs through the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association is pairing our pharmacists with ones in Zambia, Tanzania and places, and they learn together and help each other. That's been a fabulous program. We've um, got much more research going. I'm very proud of our um, breaking the market failure by this pilot we've done of pull incentives where we've a NICE worked with the Health Economics Unit at York University and the NHS to look at valuing antibiotics differently, valuing them not only by what they do for an individual, but valuing them um, by what they do for the individual, the NHS and society. They then managed to come up with a proposal of a subscription where for the next 10 years, we pay the two companies, they're Shinogi and Pfizer, a set subscription price, so they have guaranteed income. In return, we can steward the drug and use very little or quite a bit if we need it. It will be available and they have guaranteed um, stewardship elsewhere and, and safe and secure uh, supply lines. The Americans like this, they've got um, in the House a bipartisan, by house uh, proposal at the moment um, called the um, Pasteur Act, which gives you very, very similar ways of doing it, a subscription. So we hope that will go through before they um, change uh, people to the newly elected ones. So we have set a lot of things in motion and uh, the um, economics evaluation was one of the key pieces of work to wake the world up. So all of that is like incredibly dense. Like there seems to be a lot of a lot of spinning plates there. And just to touch on something that you you mentioned, how do you turn an a healthcare problem, you know, this antibiotic um, sort of resistance, antimicrobial resistance, and you know, you, you mentioned about having people price drugs in different ways, not just pricing them on a personal level, but pricing them on a level of their impact to the rest of the world, you know, so really allowing um, economics to, uh, I don't know, to for, for people who care more about economics than healthcare to get on board. That sounds really, really pessimistic. Um, I, yeah, that sounds pessimistic. And I can say it, you can't. Um, but how how do you do that? How do you turn what is good for the entire world into a function of the economy? Yes. Well, I think when you're talking about the economy, you have to talk not just about the passionate and difficult things like deaths and uh, food chain insecurity. You have to also talk about the economics. So the, Can the Canadians did a study and showed that the already – the impact on their GDP is like taking out their car industry. So the World Bank study shows that uh, if we don't act on this by 2050, an extra 28 million people will be driven into extreme poverty. So we have to start with the economy by that sort of issue. But then um, to go on to one of the other things I'm very interested in, you can, we have increasingly evidence that health is one of our greatest economic assets. I think COVID proved that. And so if you want a healthy population so that they can be in the workforce, they can be productive, they can be happy at home and live fulfilled lives, then you want to make sure that they're not getting ill with infections that you can't treat. So there's also that side of it, the productivity related to health as one of our greatest assets. It sort of seems to me rather dark. I know it's necessary in sort of your time in government and, you know, uh, like we said at the beginning, you've done all of these things. So you're the expert in that. But to me as a, a not a layman, someone someone who approaches it from the scientific angle, it seems a bit, I don't know, I get a bit 
depressed and sad in that sort of way. Does that make sense? That, or, I mean, well, it I'll does, be... because if we hmm. don't take action now, when you consider that antibiotics take about 20 years to make and put into production when you've, you've got successful ones, then it could be too late. Well, it will be too late for a lot of people if, if um, 1.3 million are dying every year. And if you think about how the things that drive AMR, you know, bad high, uh, sanitation and hygiene, we have to um, make sure that that's improved all across the world, let alone new drugs, treatments, surveillance. One of the ways we can really impact this is if we can get the world to recognize that what we're in the middle of is a silent, insidious pandemic. I talk about a lobster. COVID was the lobster dropped into boiling water. It made a big racket and people died. AMR is the lobster put into cold water, heated up slowly. It's going to die, but it makes no noise. If people will accept the problem, then we can act on it. One of the things we need to happen is there's a negotiation at the World Health Organization at the moment of a pandemic instrument for pandemic preparedness and response. We need antimicrobial resistance and this one health issue that it's not just human health, it's food security and environmental health as well, embedding into that instrument. I, I really like that that uh, I, I really like that phrase, the idea that the COVID is a lobster dropped into boiling water, whereas antimicrobial resistance is a you know a slow boiling pot and we don't realize, oh no this thing is bad until it's too late, I guess. And, you know, I think what COVID taught us, or at least what COVID has brought to the forefront, is the idea that, you know, scientists and sort of clinicians, people who work in research and in healthcare are incredibly important and are sort of fundamental and should be able to go hand in hand with with government. So in terms of how government and researchers can collaborate better at an international level to tackle this problem? Like, what can be done? Thank you for that question. I mean, uh, I think that government needs to work with scientists, but one of the big things we need, look at the impact of the independent panel on climate change, that scientists commenting on where we're going, what are the issues, what are the problems, what's the target um, to not have meltdown of the universe. What we need, and we've been saying it for years, but the um, UN has not yet done it, is the equivalent, an independent panel looking at AMR and advising as to where we are, what would be effective targets, and what's the course we're on at the moment. Um, so I want that as a big thing. Meanwhile, I want all the scientists who possibly can to find us new treatments, new ways of, of changing people's behavior so they wash their hands a lot and, um, and helping people to understand this. And perhaps even some communication experts to help me build a proper campaign rather than uh, the way I go about it, which might be considered a bit amateur. I mean, I would back it. I, if you were to do a campaign and you know you paid well, I would definitely do it. I'd say no I was more that. hoping that you would do it because you believed in it, actually, Alex. But there we I are. Do, I do believe in it. I 100% believe in it. But you were the first person to tell me that we've got to think about it in economic terms and people living productive and healthy lives. So I'm doing what we consider an uno reverse. <laughs> All right. And I'm saying, I would like to buy a house. Uh, <laughs> I would like to be able to live life. I like you to live time. a long life and not die of a drug-resistant infection. Oh, thank you. Um, if you could also use your skills to somehow make property prices a little bit, uh, uh, just decrease, just a, just a tad, so I can get a mortgage, that would be great too. So if you can put well, that on the list. We're into I'll... generational issues here, aren't we? And yeah, so if, are a really important intergenerational issue. So in terms of um, this heightened idea of, you know, what you'd hope, this ability for us all to come together and um, allow, you know, lots of different sectors to come together and sort this sort of problem out, would you think that going forward then, if we were able to do this, that you would, that tackling a problem of AMR, something as big as AMR, 
could that open the door to better government and science collaboration? It'll only work if we have really good um, collaboration between science and government, and I think we can do it. Yep. Absolutely. Oh, I like that. So, I mean, that leads nicely onto my next question is, are you hopeful for the future? Well, yes, because I'm a glass half full sort of person. And if you put in this much effort, you must see something for it. Um, I also think that while we haven't got everywhere to understand it, they will in time, because if they don't, it's going to get worse. And then they'll come to understand. So, yes, I am hopeful. But it's a lot of work to do by all of us to get it there. So for you, what would a key milestone look like? Like if tomorrow you saw X thing happen, what would you consider from your expertise, from your experience, this is a key milestone. I'd be happy with this milestone. Okay, I'm going to have two. One is the independent panel of scientists advising at the global level, and the other is that WHO pandemic instrument for preparation and response, including AMR. Okay, and so for someone like me who doesn't necessarily know where to start with something like this, what are some things that I can do to help push this forward? What can I do on a personal level? What can listeners do on a personal level to help this happen? Well, you can try and make sure you prevent infections, washing your hands and being sensible. If you have an infection and the GP says you don't need an antibiotic because it's a virus which won't respond to antibiotics, listening, if you're given antibiotics, use them as prescribed. So that's a good start. But you can also use your power as a consumer Um, and check with the supermarkets. Are they only purchasing meat where antibiotics have been used responsibly? Organic covers that, but it's expensive, whereas you may want um, just ordinary meat where they've been properly used. You can use your power through your pension fund and ask them to do activist investing because we're trying to get AMR as an ESG issue. You can talk to people about it, so they're careful too. And in your own work, you can bring up the issues, but actually, if you're a chemist, why not think about careers or helping people get into careers where we're going to find the solutions with better surveillance and testing, better drugs and everything. Oh, I like that. That's given me like real call to action. These are things that I I realistically can do. Do you know of any resources available um, for someone like me to be able to find out, you know, which which meat in supermarkets has had these good processes gone through that aren't sort of using antibiotics willy nilly? Go ask your supermarket because if you ask them, then if they don't know, they'll have to look it up, and that brings their awareness up to a good level. Oh, wonderful. Okay. And then my final question. I want you to imagine that this this podcast is being listened to by the real people in power, the ability to instigate change, those game changers. What would you say to them? I say to politicians, take action now. Stop people dying. Stop it getting worse. The immediate things in the... um, developed countries, Global North, like ours, is make sure that the new pandemic instrument being negotiated by the World Health Organization includes AMR, but actually push for the independent panel of scientists to give us advice, like the IPCC. And then, if you're British, please sing the praises of our successful pilot on market Um, incentives to other countries and persuade them to do their pilots and move into breaking the market failure so that we have a steady flow of new treatments. Professor Dame Sally Davis, thank you so, so much for joining us here today. Uh, Has this been, I say fun, but has this been a good experience for you? Well, it's been entertaining and I hope that I have been... um, clear for your listeners because this matters and I really hope they will help in the fight. All right, now it's time for some news. The Brought to You by Chemistry podcast team spoke to various experts from around the globe to investigate the challenges that antimicrobial resistance has in different countries. 
Hello, I'm here in Joshi from the Royal Society of Chemistry, and today we are interviewing Dr. Iruka Okeke, Professor at the University of Ibado. How are you doing, Iruka? Hi, I'm fine. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with you here. No, thank you for joining us. Um, so I guess the first question we want our listeners to know about is um, if you could just share with us uh, a little bit about your work at the moment. Sure. So I'm a microbiologist. I study bacteria and I'm interested in the genetics of bacteria. For antimicrobial resistance, this means understanding the genetic basis for uh, why resistance happens and how it spreads. In addition to studying uh, um, resistance in the microbiology lab, I'm really interested in uh, understanding how we can combat resistance, either by um, um, containing it or also by um, creating alternatives to antibiotics that can help us deal with infection. So uh, uh, my research touches on all of these aspects. Um, and when you say containing the resistance, could you explain to listeners what you mean by that? Yeah, so I mean, resistance is already widespread. Resistance to many antimicrobials is widespread. And this affects how patients are treated, for example, and how successful their treatments will be. Um, if health workers in the clinic can better understand what resistance is like in their localities, they can make inf more informed decisions, it, both in the choice of antimicrobials, but also in ensuring that if a patient is carrying a resistant bacterium, that the resistant bacterium doesn't spread from them to someone else. Oh, uh, right. I see. And... A question that we sort of wanted to touch upon, some of your work has entailed sort of looking at strengthening level lab medicine. How is that related to solutions around AMR? Yeah, it's key. I mean, I'm a microbiologist and actually most of my work is, is, is done looking and understanding bacteria in a research context. But we also need to understand bacteria in an everyday context in order to, uh, as I said before, contain uh, antimicrobial resistance. So the bacteria are what become resistant and they're invisible. You can't see them unless you're in a lab. And so labs are critical for being able to identify which bacteria are present where, which of those bacteria are resistant, uh, how are they spreading, and when are they gone? And these are all things that require laboratory medicine. Uh, clinical microbiologists and clinical scientists, they look at specimens that come from people who are sick to identify which bacteria are there. And they also look at specimens from the host to understand how the host is, is responding to infection and to treatment. And in terms of challenges that you've seen in Nigeria when it comes to AMR, um, what have been the main challenges and how are the solutions looking like at the moment? Yeah, Nigeria is a huge country. Uh, it's huge in land mass, but even huger in population. So we have a lot of people. We are a tropical country and there are a large number of um, infectious diseases that are endemic in Nigeria. They're caused by different microorganisms, but they often present in the same way. For example, a patient could have a fever that could be caused by any of 200 different organisms. So uh, that is one challenge, just our local demography and our geography. And then um, in addition to that, we have um, challenges from uh, that come from our health system. Um, we have uh, very few resources in our health system. Uh, very few patients are tested, even though most patients who are ill have an infection. And so for a large proportion of, of patients, we're making guesses, either informed guesses or in some cases, less informed guesses about what is wrong with those patients. Uh, uh, many patients don't even have access to care at all. Um, and there are few resources available to test. There's difficulty in obtaining supplies to test. So sometimes you might actually have your funds, but just being able to procure the materials that you need, get equipment service. Uh, these are challenges because most of what we use for um, testing in microbiology is actually imported. And then there, there's very little um, 
routine data that is collected in electronic formats. And because of that, it means that when data are available, they're often not available to those that need to make decisions. Uh, if you want data to be able to move, for example, from a hospital lab to other parts of the hospital, to a local uh, antimicrobial resistance coordinating center or to the WHO, it's much easier to do that if the data are electronic. And a lot of data in, in Nigeria um, is um, actually uh, paper-based. And then, you know, we have a really talented workforce that is overworked and under-motivated and sort of keeping them in uh, the space where they would help with antimicrobial resistance is a challenge in itself. From different angles, there's, there's lots of different challenges that put together create a huge macro issue within Nigeria. And we've spoken to other people within um, the series who have said very similar um or have come across similar hurdles i guess one thing that we have discussed previously is diagnostics and it seems like diagnostics and having quick accessible tools to determine what's wrong with people is something that is needed in nigeria are there any innovations at the moment which you or um some of your colleagues could use um, that you haven't got hold of at the moment? Yeah. So, I mean, it would be lovely to have a, a diagnostic tests that are more rapid than the ones that are, are in existence right now. But I think it's very important to emphasize that the tests that are in existence right now are underdeployed in Nigeria. Um, so there are a lot of simple culture uh, based methods, microscopy based methods that could actually help clinicians a lot in terms of managing infectious disease uh, uh, cases. Some of these are recently developed tools. Some of them have been around for half of a century. Uh, they're just not uh, uh, routinely available at the point of care. Now, um, of course, now we've seen, for example, from the COVID pandemic, that we can have a lot more than we were previously asking for. Uh, rapid uh, point of care tests for SARS-CoV-2 are available in 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 countries in Europe and um, and the and, and and North America for patients to use in their own homes, and the technology that was used to produce those tests can actually produce tests that would diagnose other pathogens. Uh, we do have malaria point of care tests that are, are not sufficiently available, but certainly widely available in, within Nigeria. And it'd be nice to have something like that for some of the major causes of bacterial infections. I guess another thing that um, like beyond diagnostics, we have tried to touch upon within this series is how to speak to the public about certain health issues what are the strategies for like the Nigerian health department when it comes to public messaging yeah I guess I can provide you anecdotal information in that area so the nice thing is that in 2017 Nigeria uh, uh, completed its national action plan for combating antimicrobial resistance and the first pillar in that plan is actually outreach to talk to people about what antimicrobial resistance is and what they should be doing to do something about it and um, the uh, National Center for Disease Control, which coordinates all our antimicrobial activities nationally, they've actually had some really nice outreach programs uh, or, or, or encourage others to implement them. One area of focus, obviously, is health workers. Uh, health workers are in health facilities. They are signed up by councils. And so they are a relatively easy to reach population. But then there are other populations, in particular, those who are the users of antibiotics who need to know more about resistance. And there has been a lot of focus that I think is very well placed on, on um, older children and young adults. Um, most of Nigeria's population is very young and they too are easy to reach via schools. And um, they're also uh, um, um, very appreciative of this kind of message and also able to pass it on to other people. And then there have been uh, efforts to uh, speak to other uh, stakeholders, such as farmers, for example, who may be knowingly or, or unknowingly using antibiotics in, 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 their, in their farming practices. So I think there's been a lot of effort. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're a very large, highly populous country. And so it's going to require sustained effort over a long period of time. 
Uh, at the last uh, AMR Awareness Week, actually, uh, um, one one of the groups that was involved in um, outreach actually translated a lot of messaging into many, many different Nigerian languages. And I think that is something really that could really take the message to uh, places where it hasn't been before. It's important to emphasize that in our setting, infectious diseases carry uh, they, they exert a huge burden. And so when you're telling people not to use antibiotics, you have to provide a route to help when someone is, is, is infected. And so that is also something that needs to go into the messaging. It sounds like there is some good work happening in the background when it, within Nigeria. Moving on to sort of a wider international look, where do you see um the value in international and regional collaboration when it comes to AMR? Yeah, I think the, the one thing about AMR is that it has so many tentacles. Uh, so many things play into it and there's so many different ways to, to fight it. And so I think collaboration in general is really important. Uh, the more approaches you can bring to dealing with antimicrobial resistance, the more successful you're likely to be. Um, the other thing is that there are... There are um, approaches, techniques, pilots that have been performed elsewhere that we can learn from and we can pilot here and see if they work well. One example is that um, there is an effort now to make um, surveillance more clinically oriented so that it's more relevant to clinicians and not just labs. And, you know, there's a new tool called ACORN that was devised to be able to do this in very low uh, resource settings that was developed and, and originally piloted in, in some Asian countries. And we're piloting it here in Nigeria because we think it might be useful uh, in our setting. So sort of, you know, sharing information is key. And then for us to be able to pick and choose what might be useful. Another place where collaboration helps uh, uh, um, a lot is innovation. Uh, the more different types of brain backgrounds you can bring to any problem, the greater the chance that you're going to come up with something incredibly creative and new. Um, so as much as we do need to conserve existing antimicrobials and figure out ways to, to use them better, we need to do something about the fact that there are not enough new antimicrobials to take us into the future. And so developing new drugs is really important. Uh, this has historically been done in North America and Europe, but now we have you know, uh, centers for excellent in, uh, um, in drug discovery across the world, including in Africa. And it, it's really exciting to for scientists in Nigeria to work with these nodes and, and be able to uh, put forward ideas uh, to, develop, to develop drugs. Amazing. Well, that's all the time we have. Um, thank you so much, Iruka. That was really insightful. Um, really appreciate your time today. Thanks, Hiran. It's been nice being on the podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me. So I am Eduardo Samugudu, uh, General Director, uh, Deputy of National Institute of Health in Mozambique, and then I am a medical doctor by training uh, with PhD in Immunology of Infectious Disease. I've been working for 20 years on infectious disease, uh, doing research, surveillance, and building laboratory systems uh, in Mozambique, as well as training in education, mostly on infectious disease. I have been working on IMR uh, since 10 years ago. Uh, we have seen an high level of inappropriate use of antib antibiotics, overuse both in human. In Mozambique, antibiotics, they are heavily used in um, animal production. And then it's common you to see people not to complete the dosage. There is a kind of a suboptimal dosage. And then you see a lot of self-medication. So in Mozambique, if you go to the pharmacy, private pharmacy and you ask for antibiotic and then the pharmacist will give you an antibiotic. There is less inf enforcement. There is a law to, to uh, provide, uh, to sell antibiotic without prescription, but this is not uh, being uh, enforced enough in Mozambique and it's common. And you see a lot of people selling and buying uh, antibiotics in the informal market. Uh, we have fever, 
And then people, when they have fever, so they already uh, understand that they know what they should take. They go to the uh, informal market and you, you can get that. Those are scaring scenarios that are scaring me uh, as a Mozambican, as a scientist, and working in, in, in public health. So that, that this is why I decided to start working on this topic. You mentioned that antibiotics are being sold within like unregulated uh, areas, so like markets. How what what has brought um, antibiotics being sold in this way? And what are the uh, solutions, if any, um, that you and or the government are working on? There are two reasons for that, for people selling and buying antibiotics in informal markets in Mozambique. The first is the low, the low level of the, of the enforcement in terms of laws, uh, regulations, mm -hmm. that. because there is a law that says that uh, prescription should be uh, sold based uh, on a medical prescription. So uh, that's the one. So there is a need in that context, there is a need to increase uh, uh, inspections to those places so that to, uh, to control that kind of practices in those places. But second piece has to do with uh, uh, knowledge awareness of population of the communities. Okay. So people, they are not aware the risk and how dangerous is this practice. So people don't know that by doing this, they are uh, rising the IMR uh, in country. And that will uh, cause serious problems for treating of infectious disease. So people are not, we have done our research, uh, we went, both for informal markets in Mozambique, and then we in informal markets we ask for the person that was selling the antibiotics and those that were buying antibiotics. We could see that there is a, there is a misperceptions both on people that is selling antibiotics, and then by they also said that they acknowledge that there is low level of law enforcement. Um, and I guess another question would be, you mentioned with your um, livestock and agriculture that um, obviously farmers are giving um, antibiotics to sort of the livestock, the cattle. What are the government doing at the moment to try and control this? Uh, there is now a national action plan for MR that was approved back to 2017. That was the first ever national action plan for MR. Uh, in, in this national action plan, there are list of activities. So there are priorities, interventions uh, that should be taken in the country to revert that scenario that what you said, the overuse of antibiotics in livestock. Uh, and then uh, within the list of intervention that are in this national action plan, to fight against IMR, there is a component of improving the laws in country. Uh, there is a component of training in education, uh, both for the society and then for the private uh, sector on, on that. Uh, and then there is a component of more oversight to ensure a more uh, uh, law enforcement that in more inspection for uh, those farms that were uh, antibiotics is being used in livestock. So I think those are the three major. So both three interventions are ongoing. Uh, obvious that there are limitation in terms of resources, uh, limitation in terms of uh, technical expertise, but there are steps that are being taken. And then I would like also to mention that Mozambique government just recently approved Global Health Security Agenda uh, Plan, the National Action Plan for Health Security in Mozambique and zoonotic disease with some emphasis on, uh, on the use of, more controlled use of IMR livestock is one of the priorities. I mean, that's, that's, that, that, that sounds really good that you have an action plan. And you did mention earlier that there are sort of challenges with resources. So what are the economic challenges 
that Mozambique are currently facing when it comes to AMR? Well, in terms of economic challenge, we can see this in different perspectives. Hmm. Uh, you could see that in terms of the consequences uh, of AMR. So you see now in Mozambique, the medical doctor that are uh, prescribing more broad spectrum antibiotics. Those antibiotics are more expensive. And in some instances, they are only available in the private market, in the private, in the private pharmacies. Uh, but uh, they are also available, some are also available in the uh, public uh, ph pharmacy. But that causes a heavy burden for the families and for people that are living under poverty. So they have to spend more on antibiotics. So there is a consequence for the country, for the health sector economically, because the country has to buy more broad spectrum antibiotics that are more expensive, meaning that the Ministry of Health has to spend more in terms of the expenditure for medication, for antibiotics. There is other component in terms of the economic challenges is that uh, in Mozambique, uh, screening, testing for IMR is expensive and cumbersome. Uh, there are few hospitals that can afford running the uh, uh, blood culture. And then uh, that has to pose two issues. The first is that uh, we lack evidence, the evidence on that, on the spread and distribution uh, trend of the IMR uh, is limited because we only have blood culture in a small number of hospitals. Uh, and second, so uh, the blood culture is important to guide the treatment of the patient. So that expanding countrywide uh, uh, blood culture and culture uh, microbiology culture is quite expensive for the country, yeah. but we have to do because the the profile of IMR is ri is rising uh, over the country. Okay, and um, I guess to sort of bring it into a more hopeful point of view, like, are you? What does the future, in your opinion, look like when it comes to AMR and solutions? Are you hopeful? that we will find a solution, not only for Mozambique, but globally? I have mixed feelings, honestly. I have mixed feelings. I have some optimism. The awareness will, will continue to rise more rapidly. And then more intense intervention are, are taken to revert that scenario. I have that optimism uh, that that will happen. Uh, but at the same time, I have a concerning feeling. I have a concerning feeling that there are very few being done so far at global, in Mozambique and global. And IMS still continue to be heavily neglected, as I said before. And then if nothing change in terms of our action, we can see the worst scenario in the future. So that is my personal feeling so on that amazing um thank you Eduardo. that was that was a really good interview thank you for your time hi everyone i'm hannah mcdonald and i am a health policy advisor at royal society of chemistry and i'm here with dr erin duffy from carb x and she is based in the united states so Erin, first of all, we're just wondering if you could uh, introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your work. Yes. Hello. Thank you, Hannah. Um, my name is Erin Duffy. Um, I am the Chief of Research and Development uh, at CARBEX. Um, and CARBEX is an acronym that stands for Combating Antimicrobial Resistance Biopharmaceutical Accelerator. That's the X. Um, we're based in Boston, but we are a global not-for-profit um, that serves to both fund and support scientifically groups to develop new solutions to prevent, diagnose, and treat bacterial infections. By training, I should say, I am a chemist, um, card-carrying chemist, um, and spent a majority of my career prior to coming to Carbex um, in the biopharmaceutical industry focused on building new antibiotics. And 
what do you see as the main challenges um, when it comes to tackling uh, antimicrobial resistance in the United States and I suppose also for Carbex and your work? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, the truth is that um, antimicrobial resistance is a global issue. Um, so I, I don't think that um, any of the things I'm going to say um, is exclusive to the U.S., um, but I think um, on the on the scientific side, um, you know, there are always challenges. I don't view them necessarily differently um, than developing a new cancer chemotherapy or, you know, cardiovascular drug. Uh, in terms of the drug discovery and development process. I think the caveat, though, um, is that unlike some of these areas, um, there, there's a constant evolution of bacteria. It's been true since the beginning of time, um, where the bacteria learn how to modify or mutate themselves when they encounter uh, an antibiotic in order to render that antibiotic ineffective. Um, and so understanding how and when bacteria modify and mutate and how you need to then uh, provide a, a solution that is active against that new type of bacteria, I think is really important. Um, so that's a scientific challenge, um, but one that's no different, you know, since people have been doing antibiotic research, um, you know, I think the successes we've had over the years since, you know, the 1930s is that you've had groups who were always coming up with a new antibiotic in different classes and um, different ways that they work against bacteria. And so having that arsenal is good. Um, having not had a lot of activity uh, or comparatively not a lot of activity in the last 20 or so years has put us a little behind scientifically. So that's on the science side. The other thing that's challenging, frankly, um, is that for a lot of bacterial infections, old antibiotics work. Um, and so it's not, you know, like 80% of all bacterial infections are caused by drug resistant bacteria. Um, and so that is less of a science problem and more of a market challenge. So, you know, when you have hospitals that are under pressure, usually under cost pressure, um, if an antibiotic that's been around since the 1930s works well for most of the population, why do I need this new expensive thing? Um, and so that's a market challenge, um, which comes back to the science challenge because in a healthy uh, pharma and biotech environment, there's investment to continue to fuel new R&D. Um, investors aren't going to invest in an area without a great market presence. And so that's the sort of double-edged sword um, that's a big challenge here. Are there any specific mm. activities, and I guess the role of Carbex mm. is one trying to overcome mm. some of that market failure, but um, are there other things happening at the moment that kind of make you hopeful to overcome some of these issues? Um, in and around, starting around 2000, is that a lot of the large pharmaceutical companies whose heritage, um, you know, was in antibiotics, almost every large pharmaceutical company um, was, you know, in the production of penicillin and then had active antimicrobial programs. A lot of those companies exited the space. And I think they exited for um, again, you know, market reasons. So there, you know, were challenges in oncology that were coming up. And, and so, you know, this is really, you know, new frontiers. Um, and so that then left the research to, um, you know, what were emerging biotech companies, small companies, um, you know, with enthusiastic researchers who needed funding uh, and often didn't have the experience um, in drug discovery and development uh, to really be able to push these things forward. And so Carbex was um, uh, founded or, you know, we were actually a project. I should have said this at Boston University. So we're not an entity, but we're a project at Boston University um, that uh, we had responded to a request for proposals from the U.S. government from BARDA. I don't know if you're familiar with BARDA, um, but they're within Health and Human Services in the U.S. Uh, who are looking at um, solutions to um, sort of better, uh, you know, promote American lives. And of course, among that is keep people healthy uh, and, and uh, free from infection. So they were recognizing this challenge that uh, there weren't as many groups in the space and those that were weren't particularly well capitalized to advance meaningfully. 
And so they had a call for proposals for an accelerator to come in uh, and really shepherd these programs, give them the funding that they need to get it done, but also add that scientific expertise through a, a network um, of, of global experts to help them really move things along from that great idea that they had coming out of the university to something that looks like a product. And are you, are you excited about the Pasteur Act in the U.S.? Do you think it's something that is, well, going to get through and could help support the um, research ecosystem? I mean, so, you know, I'm not policy gal, but um, I, I do, you know, I, I think we, we certainly see value in it. There are a lot of uh, champions of this and, and it does have, um, you know, uh, bipartisan or bicameral or whatever the term is um, support. So, I, you know, we're hopeful that um, it is something that will ultimately pass. And there are other uh, initiatives as well. There's an initiative in the U.S., not an initiative, but another piece of potential legislation called the Disarm Act. Well, that's a little different. Um, and that looks specifically at hospital-based antibiotic products um, and asks the question, can we take them out of the so-called DRG, which is that, I forget what DRG stands for, but it's basically the package. You know, If you go into the hospital and you have X, um, there's a package of what that package costs, right? And that's everything from the nurse to the bed to the antibiotics to the saline to whatever else you need. Well, if an antibiotic is in that DRG and there's a price set, then there's only so much you can charge for any one thing in that. And so the Disarm Act um, seeks to remove antibiotics from the DRG and allow them to be priced um, you know, more for their value. That's really exciting. And you mentioned you get proposals from um, all over the world and you're mm -hmm. a global funder. And so where do you see the value in international and, or regional and international collaboration to address AMR? Oh, I mean, it's critical. Um, just about a year ago, I guess, in The Lancet, you're probably familiar with this paper um, that, you know, is colloquially called the Graham paper um, that for the first time underscored the global burden of disease um, attributable to and associated with antimicrobial resistance. Um, you know, the numbers were staggering in and of themselves, but if you look at where the majority of, you know, deaths um, from infections caused by antimicrobial resistance, they're in your low middle income countries, um, you know, very heavily disproportionate. Uh, and so, but, you know, bacteria don't have borders. Um, and so, you know, if we don't address you know, if we don't aim antibiotics and, and again, prevention and, and, and diagnosis as well um, at the low middle income countries, um, you know, this will, you know, these will inevitably spread. And so, you know, we need to be mindful of what's happening in the world and build products that are responsive to them. I think in general, are you hopeful? Are you, do you, are you positive that this is something that we can address? Um, you know, I think we have a motivated um innovative research culture globally. Um, and, you know, we're continuing to ask, you know, how can we, for instance, you know, harness researchers from even, you know, larger, um, you know, places around the world or broader places around the world, even than we do today, um, you know, to, to get different minds thinking about this, but it, there's no shortage of innovation. I think that's number one. Number two is there's no shortage of uh, creative policy people looking at different solutions. And so I, I don't know which one is going to win, um, but I do believe we will have a market solution there. And then I think the third part of it is, you know, when we're talking on Zoom today, but, you know, this is three years almost to the date um, of when, you know, the world started shutting down. And I think now everybody has a better appreciation for what an infectious disease um, can do to us individually in our communities and globally. Um, and, and so I think having the conversation with the general public about you know, why we need to plan for, you know, I'm not saying you know, antimicrobial resistance is ever gonna cause a pandemic, but you know, a, a large outbreak of an infection here and there can really be disruptive. Um, and I think people get that now. So I think you have a science policy and you have, you know, my mom 
um, who, you know, okay, she's a nurse, but so maybe that's not fair, but, but, you know, she understands it too and can articulate it. And it's when we can have that shared understanding that I think we have solutions. And that's it from us. Yes. Thank you for joining us on this series, this journey into antimicrobial resistance. We hope that this has been informative and somewhat entertaining. It might be tempting, but do try avoid bathing in a bathtub full of antibac. Just don't do it. It's not worth it. With the right collaboration and government action, we can progress towards solving this issue. And then we'll be back with another series on a completely different topic that we can then solve with chemistry. All right, see you next time. <music>